Yeah, the microphone's right here. Yep. Yeah, that's perfect. 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 Y
Um, but yeah, we see a huge value in terms of this, but there's a huge What about value. actual applications? Actual applications, so what we see today um, is the classic sort of, you know, um, web tier type um, infrastructure, for example, a lot of, um, yeah, newly developed applications clearly actually built with containering in mind. Um, I don't think we have really seen any use case uh, in terms of deployments for like repackaging an enterprise app. When we talk to ISVs, they all look at containerization as a way to re-architecture their current applications, right. for example, or portfolios. I just want, before we pass it down, I want to remind everybody, uh, if you've got a question, please feel free to come up to the microphone and we'll get you um, at any time throughout this uh, session. Manju, go, go ahead. So, Greg, I think uh, one thing what we want to do is to first level set what is a container, right? There's really the actual container, which is the, you know, the Linux jail for people who've been doing the Chiru jail environment for a long time, right? That's the one, one side of the container conversation. The other side is actually the ecosystem that's building on top of container, which is like, you know, Mesos, Kubernetes, um, these type of technologies, Omega, Borg, all those things, right? Um, I think that, you know, when, when you look at the container ado adoption, people constantly mix the two pieces. Uh, the way I see is, you know, you look at the actual container, which is really providing the kernel level uh, virtualization without having to take the virtualization hit, right? Right. There is a specific set of use cases where it's really applicable. Google was doing it before even the virtualization was, you know, became big, right? And Twitter uh, lives on it, Facebook likes to do that. So, you know, these type of large players, it perfectly makes sense to not take the hit of the hypervisor tax, right? Um, and their application tends to be is, homogenous. Is it a performance or is it a cost issue or is it both? It's both, I think. Th that, that's the, you know, like cost definitely there is a big factor when you start adding the hypervisor license. That's a big cost, right? Right. And there, there is definitely some performance hit as well. You know, the people who worked on container, they can talk about, um, you know, the um, uh, user space and the kernel space, right? If you're on the user space, your performance is lower compared to if you're running something at the kernel level. And now you have an alternate option, which is like the you know, kernel load loadable modules. You can dynamically load the modules into kernel and then still get the performance benefit. Right? Now we're talking about all the geek level, yeah. low level stuff. Right? But the net is there is definitely performance benefit. If you really start uh, hardening your container, uh, to meet a specific demand, you can really get performance right. benefit, right? But the thing is with, um, you know, when I look at OpenStack, uh, virtual machine is really not going anywhere, right? Today, there's, there is so many other benefits that virtual machine brings in terms of abstracting your entire uh, ecosystem around your application. Mm -hmm. And there's like hundreds and hundreds of virtual, you know, applications that enterprises today run. Not everybody is a Google or an eBay or an Amazon, right? So, right? so if you look from their perspective, virtual machine really fits into their needs, enterprise needs. Um, so the other aspect I was talking from a container is really the whole movement around Kubernetes and Apache Mesos, those type of things, right? If you look from that perspective, I think there is a real synergy between OpenStack and container, container conversation, provided you are talking in the context of Kubernetes, for instance, or Apache Mesos. Right. There, you know, your conversation is more around cluster management, how do you manage your applications, how do you deploy your application in a large-scale environment, right? And that's a problem we are trying to solve in OpenStack as well. OpenStack has kind of done a fantastic job with the core components like Cinder, Nova, Neutron. Neutron people question, so I'll leave that. So, uh, that's Swift. a different session. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, you know, if you look at the core components of OpenStack, there is tremendous value that OpenStack brings to the table. But as you go higher up the layer, you know, people like to use Murano, people like to use, uh, you know, uh, Triple O, people like to use Puppet, people like to use Chef, people like to use Ansible. There's like a whole bunch of things, tools that are coming up right. that makes your life easy in terms of deployment, management. And then Kubernetes sits on top of it, or Mesos sits on top of it in terms of being able to manage your clusters, being able to manage your um, application. So, you know, to go back to your question, is container really a threat for OpenStack? If you look at container as a whole ecosystem, there is a clear synergy between OpenStack and container. Um, yep. If you look at just the container as a virtualization layer, 
yeah, I mean, there's a, there is an overlap. You could run container inside OpenStack as well. So it's, again, really not a threat there. I want to get to, we, we've got somebody at the microphone. I want to give an opportunity to ask the question. Thanks, Manju. Thank you. Uh, give us your name and, and uh, title, serial number. Hi, my name is Boyd Hemphill. Um, I, I'm here. Hey, welcome. Um, so Docker is a bit unique in the sense that there is a Docker daemon, which is um, unusual. Uh, for many of the other container technologies. That Docker daemon looks an awful lot like uh, a replacement for a hypervisor. So while that may not be a threat in the context of the conversation to OpenStack, it certainly seems like a, a need to evolve. Um, do you guys have any, any views on the idea that uh, the Docker daemon could replace KVM or, or Zen in some way, in some meaningful way uh, that, would allow, that would enable um, uh, a more efficient use, uh, a more uh, powerful use of, of Docker containers specifically? Who wants yeah, so, to tackle that, Kevin? Yeah, so I, I agree that for certain use cases, containers are actually more efficient than VMs. I think that's, if, you're, um, if you want to get maximum utilization, utilization of your hardware, your servers, containers is probably the better way to go because you can pack much more. But the whole idea where the containers, especially today, can replace VMs, I think it's actually a non-starter because um, until, until you can tell me that a Docker container can handle networking, <laughs> can handle full isolation and security, and can do persistent storage, right? It can't replace a VM. Um, so I think that that's not to say it may not, it, it won't advance in some of those areas, but I don't see that happening, uh, you know, for certainly within the next couple of years. So I was gonna say, uh, we've been running a public cloud based on containers since 2007. Like I think they're a phenomenal set of technology. That cloud itself runs on uh, OpenVZ containers. Uh, there, it's, it's more than just performance, it's more than machine efficiency, it's, it's ar around machine boot time, it's around ease of administration, it's around portability of, of, and migration of, those to, uh, of the data itself. The reality is that Docker with OpenStack, that you can already do it, like we have that built into our product. It's, it's capable, OpenStack is capable of that today, but there are questions around Docker itself uh, and not necessarily around pieces it doesn't provide, like yes, the networking pieces are, are not where we want them to be and the storage pieces aren't where we want them to be. That'll all get solved. Uh, it's the security pieces that I think are the big concern right now, particularly in multi-tenant or, or shared environments. And that, that's a question that hasn't been answered yet. And so in the interim, I think running containers in VMs makes sense. We do that, we have production workloads, uh, our CI workloads uh, running containers on OpenStack today. Uh, once that security question is solved, I think that, that opens up a whole new door of, of opportunity for, for OpenStack itself. Guys, real quick, we got a qu another question here. Yes, uh, so far it sounds like uh, everyone's saying that uh, containers aren't a threat to OpenStack, so I was wondering what made you guys decide to talk about this? What was, <laughs> what was the, uh, what was the little more. reason that, uh, that you thought that it might be? That was actually my idea to do that, and uh, I'm a marketing guy, and I know very well that when you put containers in OpenStack and one headline, a lot of people show up. So that's, that's one side of a coin, semi-jokingly, but uh, I think that in reality, um, there is an element of truth that um, there is a number of use cases where containers are better um, than a VM, and there is also a lot of truth around the fact that OpenStack has historically been uh, really VM centric and has been built a lot, a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, architectural decisions in OpenStack has been made around actually solving the problem of how to manage a VM. So there is, there is an element of threat, uh, which, which I think that it kind of is good for everybody to go ahead and openly discuss. I think everybody generally views it as part of the evolution for OpenStack, right? Yeah, yeah actually I want to say to take so a little controversial aspect here, but I think in the long term, containers can be a threat to OpenStack. Um, because if you really would envision people really start moving towards microservice-based architectures, where basically the services itself are self-sustaining, self-healing, etc., 
there would be much less need for a complicated, complex underlying infrastructure, possibly, because you just have immutable infrastructure underneath. But that's far out, but as you said, I think it's a good point. It hopefully gets all of us into gear to actually address a lot of the issues around OpenStack, around oper operation of OpenStack environments, lifecycle management, all those things which are really important, um, which we still all struggle today with. So today, as you know, we need, as has been mentioned many times, um, almost a PhD to operate um, uh, a cloud uh, if I you know do it yourself, you're about. for example, and stitch it together. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, no, I think there's, there's certainly a long-term threat, not in the short or mid-term, but I think Boris is absolutely right in terms of there are different use cases, and I think we can come up with use cases for all of those different implementations, being it VMs, being it VMs with Docker, being it Docker on bare metal, for example, which is all great. I mean, it gives you a lot of choice and opportunity to experiment as well. So. Great, so yeah, that's why we're here. Next question. <laughs> Hi, Chris Ferris, CTO for Open Cloud at IBM. So, uh, I think from a technology per perspective, we've already demonstrated we can run Docker or can any other kind of containers inside OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, whatever. But I think the thing that's missing here from a threat perspective is from a community aspect. You know, I think that the real threat is to OpenStack the community, not so much OpenStack the technology. The technology will evolve, <clears throat> but unless we engage OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, Docker, and sort out how we all collaborate and communicate and, and integrate our capabilities together, then there is a real possibility that OpenStack could sort of fall by the wayside for some reason. What do you see as the challenge today? What's, what, what, what's, what are the barriers? Well, I don't think, there's, I, I don't think that, that there are necessarily any barriers. I think what we do need to do, though, is get those communities engaged with each other. Right. Right, a little bit more directly. Any thoughts Caroline, on that? Caroline, any feedback? Um, I, I, I actually agree with that quite a bit. Um, when we get into conferences like we are here today, everybody gets down into the weeds and then they actually forget that we need mass. And the only way we get mass is if we all actually want to collaborate with each other and drop the religious discussions about the technology and actually figure out what problems it is that we all collect collectively want to solve between like, you know, as Chris said, the Cloud Foundry Foundation, OpenStack and all the communities and actually get together to solve it. I personally have, am seeing a lot of people wanting to use containers as if it will just replace their VMs and they can get away from VMware licensing. <laughs> that with, just because you can start using containers doesn't mean that you should. There are applications that have specific behaviors that you cannot just throw into a container. And like some of my panelists have already said, it will be a while before the containers are mature enough to be able to, to deal with some of those sort of workloads. But it's an interesting time. It's definitely an interesting time. I actually talked to two different customers in recent weeks that basically have one gig size container images. One gig? One gig because they took their existing VM and said, and now my boss said we need to go to containers, so he took the whole thing <laughs> and moved into a container. And then he said, I don't know why, but it's really slow when I try to <laughs> take things with it. It's not as fast as they keep telling me it is. So I, I, the point being, there is, uh, there is uh, real use cases that fit for containers, and there are use cases that are not. And I think we, one of the things we need to do as a community, especially when we roll out a project like Magnum, is we, uh, we, I think the OpenStack community has a tendency to jump on whatever is the latest and coolest thing. So everyone's going to go, wow, Magnum's out. Let's, let's move everything. To, let's do all containers only. I think we need to do a better job of saying, hey, this is the applications that fit, workloads that fit containers, and these are the workloads that fit VMs, and the two should be living alongside each other, along with bare metal. Very good. Next question. Hi, I'm Patrick Riley, CEO of Kismatic, the Kubernetes company that's not Google. <laughs> and my, my question is, you know, when we talk about containers, we're really talking about the Linux kernel and the features that it provides. I mean, Docker did nothing but come up with scripts to help you manage that easier. So how do we as companies put pressure on companies like Intel, companies like Docker, to make the Linux kernel better and to solve some of these security issues and actually make the technology not as a viable alternative to virtualization, but as a good you know, parallel effort? Um, I wonder if customer demand's not going to call th for that's that. That's the thing. I think um, you know, it's really funny. We were in an um, uh, OpenStack Gold member uh, meeting yesterday there was a conversation, something similar to this. How do we put pressure for people to do the right thing for Neutron? That was sort of like one of the conversation. And general consensus actually was, this is a community at the end of the day. It works more like democracy. 
you can't really put pressure. You need to let the customers and the opportunities drive the innovation, right? So I, I, I don't know if you can really say, uh, you know, I want to go and Intel double down and invest their money in improving the security. If you tell that to Intel, I'm not sure if Intel folks are here, they're going to say, what's in it for me, right? So is there a customer demand? It goes back to that, I think. I think time's also a really important characteristic here. Like the, the rise of Docker and of, and of the popularity of containers has happened so much faster than, than almost any other technology I can think of recently. Uh, and all of those vendors know these are, these are issues. Like every release that comes out uh, of Docker has some security oriented thing. Like they're working towards it, but we're just work, we're, we're talking and working in such a condensed time frame. Um, that it's easy easy to kind of take pot shots uh, when the reality is we just, we just need to give the community time to, to fix those issues. Great. Do we have another question? No, I wasn't here to put in a plug, but since he mentioned how can you press on Intel, one thing that I do want to say is I work at Intel. Um, <laughs> we do have something called... You guys should talk. We did just release Clear <laughs> Containers, which is part of our Clear Linux for Intel architecture, which does use virtualization technology to run containers. Um, this was released just last week. <coughs> it's something that people should look at because using virtualization technology does provide that level of security. So check that one out. Good. Very good. Do we have another, do we, uh, no, I have another question. Let's, I'm going to go back to, to applications for a second. I know we I talk, you know, try to pin it down here. Um, I think one of the natural questions, you know, if we look at you know, potentially low latency applications, perhaps like you know, SAP HANA and others, um, how are those impacted by containers? Or do we see a day where, or do we, are we going back to, to use cases where HANA may not be a good fit for, for containers? So uh, I, I can't speak for HANA, but I can speak for another use case similar to that, right? Um, we are incubating a solution around uh, how do we speed up the data transfer, right? You know, kind of like that traditional van accelerator, but how do you use that type of technology for today's world where you have a distributed, uh, you know, deployment of your application and there's constant conversation happening between your data centers, right? Um, and we have a technology in Hitachi Data Systems um, that's focused on TCP acceleration, right? This is a perfect example where container absolutely makes sense. You don't want to, you want to take every bit of juice out of your infrastructure, right? Um, it makes perfect sense for us to run at the lowest level, at the Linux kernel level, this type of technology. That is, all it's doing is it's taking the packet, speeding it up, maybe compressing it, optimizing the, you know, the packets, and pushing it through your pipe, mm -hmm. right? That's all it's doing. In those type of uh, you know, uh, applications where you have a single purpose, container absolutely makes sense, right? So this is you know, the type of example where I am seeing uh, container will probably get more traction as opposed to enterprise application that has to interact with three, four different components and maybe three, four even different vendors. Right, it's, it's much more, it's yeah. simple. Yeah. Jesse, you talked before about how you guys have been, have been using containers since 2007. Yeah. So what, I mean, what, give us some real world application examples and maybe even some of the challenges that you had running that within a, an OpenStack environment. Yeah, so that, that platform doesn't run in, inside of OpenStack. Okay. That's, that's outside of OpenStack. Uh, and from a workload perspective, it's, it's literally that that was the infrastructure that our customers were operating on top of um, the, for, for everything, for web apps, for uh, business apps, like all, all their, their infrastructure that powered their businesses. Uh, the biggest challenges we experienced there was, was really focused on uh, workloads that were requiring kernel hooks. Uh, so like VoIP was a big big challenge. You can think things that try to, to, to actually load kernel drivers uh, didn't, don't and didn't work uh, for us. Uh, and, I, and that continues to be a, a, a problem. But we are seeing more and more applications not need those six anymore. The, the calls are being moved into user space um, in, in many areas. Well, since this is an OpenStack conference, let's talk about some of the potential challenges with running uh, containers within an OpenStack environment. Boris, I don't know. So, I, I mean, I, I think from my perspective, the, the biggest problem, so as an operator, the big, one of the biggest problems with OpenStack today is debugging failure. And then you add another layer on top with containers, uh, and it just makes that even harder. And so like the demo yesterday, 
uh, the Kubernetes demo across Rackspace and Google, like at 500, great. Now how do you go figure out what's actually causing that? You've got so many layers of abstraction built on layers of abstraction that, that actually tracking down and, and resolving those issues becomes very, very difficult. And um, sort of figuring out a structure uh, in, from a logging perspective uh, to help carry messages through and trace messages through, I think is going to be really critical. I think the, the biggest part, one of the biggest problems right now, is piggybacking on that, is monitoring, right? Because if you're doing containers right, you know, is you're not stuffing an entire Oracle database into a container and saying, I'm done. <laughs> if you're using microservices architecture, how, if I have 200 to 2,000 of these containers, right, which make up, and, you know, 200 make up a single app, another 300 make up a di different, just as an outreach example, how do you monitor that in such a way that you're actually monitoring the, app, the entire application and not just pieces of it and then trying to uh, and then trying to figure out where the problem is yourself. That's impossible. So we need better tools to do that. And OpenStack is, needs to be able to build tools to monitor containers or, or leverage communities that are building those tools. Yeah, no, I would agree that. Um, I think it just multiplies the challenges we have already today with OpenStack where we use that it's scary to debug 50 log files from 50 different services with containers, we suddenly, as Ken said, we suddenly have like multiple hundreds of small containers make up just a single app and then you run hundreds of apps possibly. So yeah, the whole orchestration, um, how do you actually create blueprints for applications into consistent deployments, repeatable deployments, and I think we all will see a lot of deployments who may not just only be, say, an OpenStack, but maybe across different infrastructures, for example. Then it's certainly a big challenge for all of us, again, uh, how do you operationalize, how do you do proper top troubleshooting, for example. Um, I think the good thing is from the container side, um, as earlier for security, um, not only all of us working really hard on getting sort of containers to a place where they are more secure. I think performance-wise, we, we feel pretty confident today. We've done a lot of testing. They do very well, I would say, for the large majority of workloads uh, we are looking at, but there's always some very specialized low latency. Telco is always a great example around NFV, for example. But as Jess said, it takes time, it gets there, but we are moving much, much faster. If we talked about the six months ago, we were already, hey, containers, that's very, really, really early, but now people use it in production already. It, from your, uh, with how Red Hat does this, are there reference architectures? Are there, you know, when, you, when, when a customer is first engaging with you about leveraging containers, what's the roadmap look like? What is, it, is, every, is every environment unique and, and, and uh, a snowflake? a special snowflake that, that requires uh, unique hands-on attention, or are there templates that can be leveraged to, to make that transition smoother? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. We want to avoid creating all these in-world snowflakes, which then becomes unsustainable to manage them. And to tough to support, support them, other things, for example, right. et cetera. Um, and also for the customer, it becomes just impossible even just to collaborate with other customers. If everybody has just their own unique snowflake, um, then we end up in everybody has their own proprietary infrastructure at some point, which really doesn't help anyone. So what, what, are, so, what are the tools you're using so, to provide guidance around that? Yeah, so I think from sort of a reference architecture, we do have reference architecture for various sort of application deployments. I think Docker is really early for this, because again, today Docker is more applicable to really a lot of sort of the new development. Um, we are moving on the company side, we are moving, for example, to Docker or containerize all of our middleware portfolio where it makes sense, for example, to deliver these capabilities as services um, and then push them out either as virtualized, as Docker, in OpenShift, whatever it might be, for example. Um, so we do create this reference argument. We try to guide customers through anything for Docker. It's much more educational exercise, as Ken said, Caroline and others, is to explain to them where it actually makes sense to look at Docker rather than just blindly go, I want to wrap up my HANA into Docker. Yeah, they heard they read about containers in an analyst report. Now they've right. got to have a it's container. It's a shiny object, yep. and as you said, every gravitates towards it. Caroline? So thanks for mentioning blueprints there. Um, so the... So cause for those of you who, uh, who may or may not know, CloudSoft is actually based on the Apache Brooklyn project. We're one of the largest contributors to it, and it is an open source project. We also have um, Clocker, which we've used to actually, and we're working very closely with Docker to fix a lot of the networking and things like that, and also applying blueprints to Docker containers that want to go on clouds that are heterogeneous. So we don't actually care which type of cloud you want to use. And so the biggest issue that I've been seeing is a lot of people, now there's so many areas, so many layers of abstraction 
that we're getting more and more calls for people who just want to go, look, I just need a blueprint for my app and I want to be able to move it from place to place. So how do I actually do that? Because the in the weeds discussions are great, but and like Jesse said, you know, so many things are also now coming up into user space. And so there's more demand for actually making things easier to consume. And also for those of us who've been in tech for a long time, things are very different now. You can get a blueprint from anyone, basically. If you've got a GitHub, you can fork someone's code and you can start to do stuff. But how it actually works the way you want it to changes. So if you can actually build different blueprints for other people to take on the same workloads that you've done, I think it saves a lot of us a lot of time and it helps us also understand that enterprises need to operate differently and how we can make that easier for them to use the new technologies. Boris, I imagine you're fielding tons of questions around containers. How much of it is just kind of response to the hype? And how much of it is from a, they see the value uh, for their application or for their environment to leverage that? It's kind of a loaded question, I know, but. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I wanted to comment first because I think we started on the thread of uh, some of the problems in OpenStack in terms of making it more container friendly. Um, and then we've evolved into somewhere else, so I wanted to comment on the on the first part. Um, so the the two very obvious kind of gaps that I see, um, one is around networking, as everybody already mentioned. So container networking is quite quite a bit of a different beast than what, what Neutron was originally built for today. So a lot of it has to be refactored and redone if we want to use, you know, still Neutron for effectively doing um, network management for container world. Um, the other one is um, the scheduler, uh, because um, um, if you look at Nova Scheduler, Nova Scheduler is built um, around scheduling VMs. And um, the, the biggest value of actually managing the container um, is uh, actually you know, having these monitoring hooks and uh, being aware um, of certain behavioral patterns of the microservices or applications that are wrapped into container and uh, uh, manage uh, the cluster based on those behavioral patterns. Um, and um, naturally, you know, when, when, when you have a scheduler that, that only thinks in terms of VMs and can monitor EVM, and if VM is busy, let's you know, move this VM somewhere else, um, that, that kind of kills a lot of the um, um, native value that bare metal containers bring. Um, so now going to your question that was about uh, what, what people are well, asking. Well, I'm sure you're getting lots of questions about containers, but how many of those are really kind of informed um, interest to deploy containers in, in their environments uh, with a specific mission, specific purpose, where it really adds value? Um, we, we don't get so much questions about containers, to be honest, but uh, again, um, going back to you know, the question of definition of containers, so nobody comes and asks us, you know, how do we use Docker with OpenStack? Um, that, that question doesn't come up, but there's a lot of questions around uh, you know, using Mesos with OpenStack or using Kubernetes with OpenStack or using Cloud Foundry with OpenStack. And um, you know, from, from our vantage point, um, you know, we, we see containers more as, uh, you know, manifest themselves in, as, as, as platform as a service. So, you know, and, and this is kind of my also kind of notion that there's been kind of a lot of hype around Docker um, and the values primarily around uh, it as a packager. But um, the long-term view, I think, uh, on uh, um, kind of uh, containers is that uh, uh, the, the key path to monetization and the key value is uh, in actually container orchestration. And this is where everybody's going now. And uh, container orchestration is really nothing more than uh, platform as a service. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, you know, different players now evolving and approaching this from different angles. So historically, we've had Cloud Foundry in the space, and Cloud Foundry has their own container standard, Warden, only their approach to uh, kind of pushing the benefits of container was never um, revolving around container as a packaging engine. They, from the beginning, outright started saying that, you know, the value is not actually, you know, using containers a higher value of abstraction so that uh, developers can actually operate whole microservices or, or applications. Everybody knows Cloud Foundry as a, as a platform, as a service. Now, um, Docker came around and um, Docker kind of, you know, built this super cool thing that makes it very easy for, for developers to package application dependencies in the container. And um, they've, they've you know, ridden this wave and they've kind of conquered um, the container standard, so to speak. And now they've conquered that standard and they're like, okay, well, you know, we need to figure out a way to make money um, 
doesn't look like Docker Hub is uh, the gold mine for us. So let's start going kind of a you know, Docker swarm in another direction, going up towards the container orchestration. So all of these movements uh, ultimately, and you know, Google Kubernetes is there also, so that's also ultimately you know, moving in the same direction. So all those movements are kind of converging in, into paths. So to answer your question, you know, when end users come to us, um, typically those end users are not developers. Uh, those, those end users are, you know, um, um, line of business owners or, you know, VPs of infrastructure type of people. And they, they don't necessarily ask a question, how do I use Docker? They're Their solving a business is, problem, not Yeah, yeah. how problem. do I increase agility? How do I make my developers more productive? Blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's all about platform as a service, which ties back to containers. Right. Okay. So, yeah. If anybody else, we, we're going to be wrapping up here uh, in the next five minutes. So if anybody else has any final questions, please come up and we'll get to you. Go so ahead. So maybe that's actually the real question. The question shouldn't be, is containers a threat to OpenStack? It should be, are containers of, uh, creating a new type of PaaS? Yep, a right? threat to platforms. Uh, structured PaaS versus, versus unstructured PaaS. And, I, and one of the things I've actually said on Twitter before, the ironic thing is the way, the, the way if you guys know, Doc, uh, Docker actually came out of technology that uh, dot cloud used to build their, their public paths. Uh, ironically, the way things are going, they'll be building a private pass out of Docker and using and selling that. So, uh, so the question really is, you know, do you, do we want, is there a future where OpenStack together with Kubernetes and Docker will be used to create a loosely coupled paths uh, where you can face, basically treat everything like Lego pieces, put them together and then, and then make your, your developer workflow work. That's great. We're gonna, you know, we got just a few minutes left. We're going to wrap up, so if we can just go quickly down the line for some final thoughts. Go ahead, Banjo. So I was just going to add to that. You know, uh, when I started my comment, I said, when you look at uh, a container conversation, people are talking about the actual container and all this ecosystem of Kubernetes, Apache Mesos. I think um, I think having this type of conversations help clarify what are we really talking about. And people who literally read Dilbert as opposed to seeing the sarcasm <laughs> in it, right? We need to clear the air with those guys. And I think to what uh, Boris said, really the way I see things evolving is OpenStack will provide the core components of how do you have a standard way of communicating to infrastructure. And the upper layer, we are adding a lot of projects in OpenStack, but there are also initiatives from Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, Apache Mesos, there are a lot of other things going on outside of OpenStack. I think we are in a good time now and, you know, may the best solution win. I think, you know, just like, you know, about two, about a year and a half back, we were on a panel, we were discussing about, uh, you know, uh, what's the best way of productizing OpenStack. Some were talking about right. distros are bad, some were talking about whole bunch of things, right? Private cloud is the way to go, and some are saying there is no such thing as private cloud, and now we are at a different phase. I think in about a year or two years down the line, I think a clear winner in, will emerge at the orchestration layer. Could be a flavor of, uh, you know, Mesos, Kubernetes, and something else, and Murano on OpenStack. I think uh, that's the transition I see happening in OpenStack. We need to move it along just for some quick final thoughts, Karen. Um, so, plugging for Kismatic, for Patrick, thanks for the question. Um, for Kubernetes help, go and see Patrick, he's the bomb. Um, but if you do want to understand more about application blueprinting and how it also relates to containers, regardless of whether it's, um, you know, what your underlying IS is, please do go to our GitHub. We're at Brooklyn and Brooklyn Central, and we also have the Clocker project that's sitting in there. And I would love to hear more thoughts on different applications that all of you are working on through um, our GitHub repo. Thank you. That's great. Jesse? Yeah, I, I think the closing thought for me is all of us in this room, we know what containers are, we know what, what Docker is. I think we're a minority in, in the technology segment. Uh, we're still dealing with people that are trying to figure out how to use OpenStack and the value prop for OpenStack itself, let alone containers on top and container orchestration and Mesos and Kubernetes. Like, there's so much complexity here uh, that it's going to be a very long time before we're able to, to really penetrate um, sort of the, the hearts and minds of, of IT in, in aggregate. So uh, it's early, and I think it's, uh, it's right. Though there's plenty of time to sort of figure out uh, what role each piece of technology has in the final solution. Sure, we'll bounce it down toward the end here as we wrap up.